Hello there, you're watching Differential Questions by Alex. All right, so today's topic is gonna be, it's, uh, the name is very lengthy, Homogeneous Linear Differential Questions with Constant Coefficients. So let me give you the format of the equation and then that way we can see what we're working with. So it's gonna be homogeneous because we have a zero here. It's a constant coefficients because the A, the B, and the C, they are assumed to be constants. And it's second order because that's the highest derivative. And so we know that this, uh, Second order linear differential equation is going to have uh, two linearly independent solutions. So y1 and y2. And so we want to know the formulas of these guys. Okay, so that's the goal. We have the differential equation and then we want to find the y1 and y2 that are linearly independent and that are solutions to the differential equation. So the method that we're going to use is very simple. It's actually only one step, but I broke it down into three parts. And so the first step says, assume that the solution is of the format y is equal to e to the mx. So we're, we're supposing that the solution is an exponential function, all right? And here, what we're doing is that we are changing the question from being a differential equation into, after we substitute, our question now is, what what is the value for m? The question is, what is the value for m? All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to substitute this y function. We're going to plug it in into the differential equation, and then we're going to get this thing called the auxiliary equation. So let me just uh, show you these, show you the uh, step, um, these three steps, and then we'll see what we have to do afterwards. All right. So we suppose that the solution to the differential equation is an exponential function. All right. So that we are going to suppose that the y is equal to e to the mx. Then we're gonna, we have to use the first derivative, so which is e m e to the mx, and then the second derivative, which is m square e to the mx. So we're going to plug in these three pieces of information into the differential equation. And then when we do that, we get the following equation. We get a m squared e to the m x plus b m e to the m x plus c e to the m x is equal to zero. All right, so now here we notice that every single term has the exponential term uh, factor. And so we can factor that out and then eliminate that and so we end up with the following equation. We get a m squared plus b m plus c is equal to zero. I guess the easiest way to think about it is that we can divide out by the e to the mx. That's because it's always positive. So that's the kind of like the easy explanation. All right, so now we have this blue equation and then this blue equation is what we call the auxiliary equation for the differential equation. All right, so now what we have done is uh, we changed the original red equation, which is a differential equation. We have now changed this into an algebra equation. So we have this blue equation on the bottom, which is an algebra equation. And again, the question that we now have is that what is the value for m? As soon as we know the value for m, and then we expect the value for m to be two different numbers. And once we know that, then we can figure out the y1, y2 that are linearly independent solutions to the differential equation and then they are going to be exponential functions. So we just need to find the m, all right? So that's the goal. And since we have a quadratic equation here, m is the unknown and this is a quadratic equation, that means that we should use the quadratic equation. All right, so I just rewrote the equation here for you. And then I just reminded you what the quadratic formula is. All right, so here the important part is that we need to focus on what is under the square roots, okay? So depending on what is under the square roots, uh, this is going to give us uh, either two real numbers. Actually, let me give you the choices here. Uh, we, this is the discriminant. We call this the discriminant, uh, which is what is under the square roots. And then depending on whether it's positive, negative, or, or zero, then we have uh, different choices for the M, or a different type of M. So whenever the under the square root is positive, then we're going to get two real numbers, two real roots to the quadratic equation. So two values, two real numbers for the value of m. When the discriminant is equal to zero, then we are going to get only one real number. And so we, we know that this is repeated twice, this number is repeated twice. And so we have to find, we have to do an extra step to figure out the other missing uh, value for m. All right, so, and then we have a third case, which is when the discriminant is negative then this is going to lead us into having two complex numbers, two complex roots, because the discriminant or the thing under the square root is negative. So we have three cases. And so what I've done is I'm going to give you three examples, one example for each case. 
Uh, the first two are easier. The last one is going to be a little bit more lengthy, uh, but I'll try to give you the shortcut um, summary of it, and then I'll try to explain the theory for the for the part three. So part three is a little bit more detailed, uh, but I'll I'll break it down later on. All right, so we can take a little break here if you wanted to. So now that you've taken a little break, now we're going to go into the three different type of equations that we have. All right. So they all have the same format. So second order linear differential equation with numbers in front of the y, y prime, and y double prime. All right, so we want to find the general solution to this, okay? And so what we should practice is the following. Uh, we have the format already, but I'm going to repeat the method, okay? So we are going to assume that the solution is an exponential function, okay? So we're going to assume that the solution to the differential equation is an exponential function. And now the question is, what is the value for m? What is the value for m? And so in order to in order to find that value for m, we need to plug in the y into the differential equation, but we also need to plug in the derivative and also the second derivative into the differential equation. And so we're going to plug this in into the differential equation, these three pieces of information, and like we did before, except that now this time we have uh, specific numbers, the 2, the negative 5, and the 3. And so we have 2 m square e to the mx minus 5 m e to the mx plus 3 e to the mx is equal to 0. And again, this is a specific case where we see that we have this exponential factor in each term. And so we can factor that out, or in other words, we can divide that out or eliminate that. And then we end up with the following algebraic equation. So 2m squared minus 5m plus 3 is equal to zero. So now this blue equation is your auxiliary equation, and which is an algebraic equation, auxiliary equation. And so now we want to uh, solve this quadratic equation. And so either you know how to factor this quadratic equation or you use the quadratic formula. So suppose that we, we try to attack the problem by trying to see if we can factor. And so after playing uh, around with it for a little while, then you will see that first, First of all, you need to put 2m on one parenthesis and m on the other one. And then you have a, a 3 to, to work with. And so it's gonna, the factors will be 1 and 3. And so if after you play around, uh, let's see, I'm going to put a 1 and 3. And I know both of them are going to be negative. So let's put the 3 here, put the 1 here. So negative 3 minus 2, and give you negative 5, and then positive. Yep. So those are the two factors. And then you, this is just guess and check. And so it might take a little while at other times. And so here you get two numbers. So the first number is going to be positive 3 over 2. And then numbers, the other number is going to be 1. All right, so these are your two numbers that you get from your quadratic equation, which is the auxiliary equation. And so what that means is the following. It, it remember that in the very beginning, we said that the solution to the differential equation in red is this blue function. Uh, blue box function, which is y equal to the mx. So that means that the solutions are y1 is equal to e to the 3 half x, and then y2 is equal to e to the 1x. So those are your two linearly independent solutions to the differential equation. Once you know your two linearly independent solutions, then you can write down your general solution to the problem. All right, so this is assuming that you know how to factor, but suppose that you don't know how to factor, and so what would you do? So you would rely on the on the quadratic formula. So let me just put a little box here to indicate that we are finished with the problem, but I want to kind of just give you also the other version of this, where you don't know, where, where it's not so easy to, suppose that it's not easy to see the factors, suppose. So what do you do? So you would use the quadratic formula, and so it says m is equal to and negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. And so you have to identify the a, b, and c. And so here's a, b, c. The a is 2, b is negative 5, and c is equal to 3. All right, so plug in those numbers, then you will have positive 5 plus or minus square root of 25 minus uh, 4 times a, let me just write it out, 4 times 2 times c, which is 3, divide the whole thing by 2a, which is 2 times 2. So you have 5 plus or minus 
And then 4 times 2 is 8, 8 times 3 is 24, 25 minus 24 is 1, so you just get a 1 here and then a 4 here. And then if you look at the, so 5 plus 1 gives you 6 over 4, and then 5 minus 1 gives you 4 over 4. And so you reduce these numbers and then you'll get 3 over 2 and 1, which are the same exact numbers that you got before. So in any case, whether you know how to factor or whenever it's easily factorable, you get your M1 and your M2, and then you get your solutions right away. But if you are not able to factor right away for whatever reason, then you can always rely on the quadratic formula and it never fails as long as you do the arithmetic, arithmetic correctly. And so you get your two values for the M and then you just uh, write down your exponential functions. So th those, those are your linearly independent uh, functions that are solutions to your problem, but the question is asking you for the general solution to the problem. So general solution to the problem. And so let me just write it here on the very top. So the general solution will be y is equal to c1 e to the 3 half x plus c2 e to the x. Right, it's a little crowded there up there, uh, but this is just a linear combination of the y1, y2 functions. Yeah, the linear combination of the y1 and y2 functions. And that is your general solution to the differential equation from the very beginning. All right, so that's the easy case. Okay, so just a little bit of review of the quadratic formula uh, to solve this. The, this is the easy case. Okay, so now let's go into the second question, which is the second uh, type of problem that you, you might get. Okay, and they, they look very similar, they all have the same format. And so Let's start from the very beginning again. So what I do, I start and say, well, I'm going to assume that the solution is an exponential function. And then my question now is, what is the value for m? What is the value for m for my differential equation, for this uh, y function, exponential y function, to be a solution to the differential equation? And so what I need to do is I need to plug in the y function, but also the derivative and also the second derivative into the differential equation. And again, I know that I already said this twice already, but I'm going to repeat the story. And then I'm going to say that I plug in these three pieces of information into the differential equation. And when I do that, I get m squared e to the mx minus 14m e to the mx plus 49e to the mx is equal to zero. All right, so now again, we notice that each term has an exponential. And so we eliminate that because we can get rid of the exponential. And when we do that, then we end up with the auxiliary equation, which is m squared minus 14m plus 49 is equal to zero. And yes, it's true that some of you might notice the pattern that the y double prime is replaced with the m squared, the y prime is replaced by the m, and then the y just goes away and you just have the number 49. Compare the blue, compare it with the red, there is a pattern, but uh, don't rely on the pattern, rely more on the idea that you are in the very beginning assuming that the, that the function that is a solution is an exponential function. That Most people forget this, so I'm trying to remind you that if you repeat the process over and over again, then you will never forget where this blue function is coming from. It's not, it's not just uh, changing the y double prime to an m square. It's not, it's not just simply that. All right, anyways. So we have this quadratic equation, and what is the quadratic equation called? This is called your auxiliary equation. And so now we want to either factor or use the quadratic formula. Okay, factoring in this case is not going to be so straightforward because it does um, actually it is possible to factor. Okay, so this is n minus seven times n minus seven is equal to zero. So you can double check. Okay. But the tricky part here is that you have repeated roots. So this is the second case where you have repeated roots. And so that's what we mean by repeated roots here. So that means the following. That means that you don't have two functions. You only have one function because you cannot just repeat the same function again. So one solution to the differential equation is this y1, which is the e to the 7x. y1, which is e to the 7x. And so now the question is, how do you find the second solution? So the question is, how do you find the second solution? 
So do you remember that in the previous section we had a second order differential equation and the difference in the previous section we had a second order differential equation and a solution was given to you and if you do have a solution you can find the second solution to the differential equation and that is called the method of the reduction of order method. All right so that's what we're going to do. Uh, so let me just summarize here. We start we started off with the red differential equation assume that the solution is an exponential, we got the blue equation. For the blue equation, we have one solution, which is m equal to seven, which gives us that one of the solutions to the different equation is y1 e is equal to e raised to the seven x. Now we need to use the reduction of order method to find the y2 solution. So there's two ways to solve that. One is a little lengthier, which we need to practice. The other one is you have a formula. And so we're gonna use the formula here but you have to remember what's given to you. So here, I'm going to summarize the reduction of order method. So you have a different equation and then you are given a solution. So we said previously that this E related to the seven X, this is one solution to the different equation. And then we got this by looking at the auxiliary equation. So now that we have a different equation with one solution, then we can find the second solution by using the formula. But before we use the formula, then, we, we have to make sure that the differential equation is in the correct format. And what is the catch here? The catch is that this differential equation has to be in standard form. Standard form. And in this case, it is in standard form. It, it means that there's like a one here in front of the y double prime. If you had like an x or a five or anything besides a one in front of the y double prime, then it is not in standard form. So you have to kind of divide that out. All right, so now that you know that this is in standard form, you have to identify the correct P function. And what is the correct P function here? Well, it is the number in front of the Y double, uh, in front of the Y prime, which includes the negative sign. So this is negative 14. So what, we're, what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the exponential guy inside here. So this is going to be E raised to the negative of the P dx. And so this is going to be e raised to the negative of negative 14 dx. The negatives go away. And what is the integral of 14? Well, that is going to be e raised to the 14x. And so that, that is your exponential guy. Okay? This is equal to e to the 14x. So now I'm going to put this into my formula. And then that way I can calculate my second solution. So this is the reduction of order, and I'm gonna use the formula. And y1 is e raised to the seven x, integral of the red part turn out to be e to the 14 x. And on the bottom, this is y1 square, which is e to the seven x. And we need to square this function on the bottom, dx. When you square the bottom, you get the following. So this is e to the 14x on the numerator, and then the denominator is also 14x dx. So just one more step here that I want to show. This is the integral of 1 dx, and what is the integral of 1? It's going to be x, well, I should have written it out this way, e to the 7x multiplied by x. All right, so we have our second solution here now. So our first solution was given, and I'll put this in black here now. So the first solution was y1, which we got from the auxiliary equation. And now what we're saying is that our second solution is given by x e to the seven x. And then we got this second solution uh, with the reduction of order methods. Okay. So the black boxes, those are our answer for this problem. All right, so that's the second case for this type of problems second case okay so one type of problem which is linear homogeneous differential equations with constant coefficients all right so we have one more case so one more example all right so before we move on uh, i just want to remind you we had the differential equation in this case and then what we did was we first assumed that the solution was an exponential and then that's how we got the first solution and I'll put that in blue. And then so the first solution was obtained by the auxiliary equation. Then we get the second equation by using the method of reduction of order, where in this case, we have a formula. 
and then that's how we obtain the second solution. All right, so now let's move on to the third case. Third case is going to be a little bit more tricky. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the answer first, and then I'm going to explain why we got that answer. Okay, so the process is still the same as before. We have we make the assumption that the solution to this differential equation is going to be this exponential function. So we're saying here we have a red differential equation, and then we want to know what the function y that satisfies this differential equation. And so what we're going to do first is we're going to assume that the solution is an exponential. And we, again, plug in the y function, the first derivative, and then also the second derivative into the differential equation. And then what do we get? We get the auxiliary equation after we simplify. So let me just write down the steps, e to, e to the mx plus 4 e uh, four m e to the mx plus 7 is equal to 0. Oh, 7 e to the mx is equal to 0. And OK, so I'm just repeating the steps here just to kind of um, emphasize what the process is. We do the process, and then at the end of the day, we get this auxiliary equation. But we have to remember how we get the auxiliary equation. So a lot of people just remember, you know, go from the red equation to the blue equation right away, but they have no idea where the blue equation came from. All right, so we have this auxiliary equation, and now what I want what I want to do now is I want to focus on the discriminant, and the discriminant is b squared minus 4ac. Okay. So we should have done this in the other problems, but on the other problems, it is much easier to factor. And actually, for actually, I should say that for any of this type of problem, question one, two, or three, you first find the discriminants. And so, on the first case, the first question, the discriminant was positive. On the second case, the discriminant was zero. In this third case, the discriminant will be negative. So let's do the calculation. So b squared is going to be 16 because because of the four. B is four, so b squared is 16 minus four times c uh, times a times c. And so this gives you 16 minus um, 28. And this gives you negative 12, which is, it is negative. So negative 12 is a negative number. So what we're saying is that the discriminant is negative. And so in this case, in this case, the solutions, they are going to be exponentials, uh, but we, there, there's one little thing that we want to kind of change okay not a big deal but uh, let's see what we get whenever we write down the the solution so let me write this in gray okay so that that's the discriminant which is given by this formula so now i'm going to go into my quadratic formula and so this is going to be negative b plus or minus the square root of d we already calculated the discriminant so that's why i need to i don't need to write down everything else again divided by 2a so in this case the negative b is negative 4 plus or minus a square root of the d, which is negative 12, divided by 2 times a. And then what is a? 1. So let me just do a little bit of work here. The negative sign, I'm going to write it out as an i. And then the 12 can be written as 4 times 3. Divide the whole thing by 2. So I'm trying to show my steps. So this is negative divided by 2 plus or minus i and then square root of 4 is a 2 and square root of 3 stays there and then you have a 2. So this is just a little bit of arithmetic and showing a little bit more steps than necessary. So here I turn this into negative 2 plus or minus i and then the 2 go away so this is square root of 3. All right so this is the solution so far. So negative 2 plus or minus i square root of 3. And so what that means is that we have two, our two solutions. Okay? So y1 is going to be e raised to the negative 2 plus i square root of 3x. And y2 is going to be e, going to be negative 2 minus i square root of 3 in parentheses x. All right, so it's a little bit crowded in here, uh, but I hope that you can see the, the two exponential functions. And so technically, we are done with the problem. 
we are done with the problem. So almost, okay. So the question again is asking you for the general solution, which is the combination of the Y1 and Y2, which is the general solution is gonna be C1, Y1 plus C2, Y2. So what I'm trying to say is that as soon as you have the Y1 and Y2, then you are essentially done with the problem. But now I wanted to look at the Y1 and the Y2. Both Y1 and Y2 have this I number, okay, this I number. And just to make sure we are on the same page, I is the number square root of negative one. And so that's what we have on the solution. So we have I square root of three and I square root of three. One, and a half, one of them has a positive, the other one has a negative in front of the I. So the, the, the thing that here is that depending on what you're doing, dealing with, uh, physics, biology, chemistry, electrical engineering, or whatever you're dealing with, sometimes you do want the complex number, the I, or, and then sometimes you don't. You want to work with something that does not have the I, and so you need to work around this Y1 and Y2 being complex functions. So that's what we are going to do. We're going to change the, the way the Y1 and the Y2 look like. So in theory, we are done with the problem. We did find the Y1 and the Y2, and so we technically find the general solution. But we don't, for this class, we don't like the complex number I, at least not in, in this section of the book. So what we do is we're going to change the Y1 and then the Y2 so that they don't have the I. So that's what the next steps are about. Okay, so here, what I've done, is kind of kind of the abstract version of what we just did. So we had the quadratic formula, and then we simplified the numbers, and then we had this, and I believe we had two plus or minus i squared over three in our specific problem. But here I'm making it more general. The two is the alpha, and then the beta is the squared over three. Right. So forget about the actual number. Let's just work with the alpha and the beta. So what I'm trying to say here now is that we want to change this i. We don't, we don't want to deal with this i. And so what we do is we, uh, we, we, we have our two solutions, y1, which is this exponential function, but we have the i. And so we're gonna break it down into, we're gonna distribute the x first. And then we, once we distribute, we can split up the exponential into two parts. So this one has e to the alpha x and then e raised to the i in beta x. Same thing for the y2. We initially have the y2 function to be this alpha minus i in beta x, but we're going to distribute the x and we're going to split up the exponential in this format. Okay. So, so now, in order to get rid of the i, we're gonna have to use this thing called the Euler's formula. So I wrote it here for you. And just know that e raised to the i theta, theta could be anything. So theta sometimes is going to be beta and theta is gonna be negative beta in other cases, okay? So uh, two case, the first case gives you the positive beta, the second case gives you the negative beta. Uh, but we are going to use this Euler formula. And remember, our goal is to change the m which are complex numbers. And so these functions are complex functions. And so we want to change the complex functions to real functions. And so what we're, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the general solution. So this thing in red is the general solution. And then we're gonna make specific choices for the C1 and the C2. So we're gonna make C1 equal to one half and also C2 equal to one half into this general solution. And so when we do that, so let's uh, do the work. So we'll get y is equal to one half. Uh, actually, let me do, actually, yeah, we'll have one half e to the alpha x multiplied by, and here I'm actually missing an x here on my betas. So this is e to the i beta x plus one half e to the alpha x times e to the i beta x. All right, so both terms have a one half and they also have a alpha to the x. So we can factor that out, okay? So this is going to be e one half e to the alpha x outside. And then the i, the e to the i beta x, this is going to be equal to cosine of beta x plus i sine of beta x. So this is the tricky part. We are using the Euler formula here. The Euler, that's, that's actually how you read it. It's not Euler, it's a Euler. 
Now the same thing for the other guy, but this other guy has a negative sign. Okay, so there's a negative sign here in front of the I in beta X. And so for that guy, we get, let me put that in gray. So plus cosine of negative beta X plus I sine of negative beta X. All right, so one thing that we need to know about the cosine and the sine is that if you have a negative inside of the cosine, you can just get rid of it. If you have a negative in front of the sine, if you have a negative inside of the sine, then you can factor that out sine. So I'll show that in the next step, that way we are on the same page. So this is gonna be e, one half e to the alpha x, nothing here, cosine beta x plus i sine beta x. And then this is gonna be plus cosine of beta x. So again, if you have a negative inside of the cosine, you can just get rid of it because the cosine function is an even function. For the sine function, it's actually the opposite. You you can you have to factor it outside, and so you get sine of beta x this way. All right. So now notice that the sine part goes away. The sine part goes away. One of them is positive, the other one is negative. So that goes away. And so you end up with the two copies of the cosine. So one half e to the alpha x, and then you have two copies of the cosine of beta x. But now things are being multiplied, so the twos cancel out. And so this ends up with e to the alpha x, cosine of beta x. All right, so a lot of stuff here. And like I said, this is kind of like the explanation or the yeah, the explanation of how we change the complex functions to real functions. And so here comes the tricky part. We, we have done all this, and let me, let me just remind you that we started off with the general solution. The general solution is always y is equal to c1y1 plus c2y2. Okay. So that's what we started off with, and here is the catch. Initially, we have y1 to be this guy in blue, e to the alpha x times e to the i beta x. And what we're going to do now is we are going to change the y1. y1 is now going to be this specific e to the alpha x cosine beta x, okay? All right, so this is just half of the process, okay? and this is half of the process. So what, we, what, what we're doing, dealing with is that we have these complex functions but we don't like complex functions, at least not at this point of the semester. And so we need to change them into a regular real functions. And so we have done that for the y1 now. y1, we're going to uh, choose this e to the of x cosine beta x. And we did this by making specific choices of the c1 and the c2. Now we're gonna, on the next part, we're gonna choose different choices for c1 and c2. And then that's how we are going to create a uh, y2, a different y2. We have a y2 here, which is given to us in the blue, blue box, but that is an X, has a complex number. And at the moment, we don't, we don't like the complex numbers. And so we are going to, again, start with the general solution. This is the general solution of the differential equation. And then we're gonna make specific choices. And so when we do this, in this case, I won't do all the, all the steps, but what I'm trying to say is this, we're gonna have negative i divided by two, and this is e to the alpha x multiplied by e to the i beta x. And again, there's supposed to be an x here in my formulas, and plus i divided by two e to the alpha x multiplied by e to the negative i beta x. All right, so we chose a specific values for C1 and C2. Notice that these values have the, the number i, okay? These values have the number i. And so I'm going to give you what we're going to need here. So remember that i represents the number squared root of negative one, the imaginary number. So that means that i squared is going to be equal to negative one. So that's one extra piece of information that we're going to need. Not difficult, but it's needed. All right, so make sure that this is negative there. All right, so at the end of the day, I'm gonna give you the answer here, okay? So at the end of the day, you do this similar algebra that we did before, and then you're gonna end up with the y is equal to 
e to the alpha x sine of beta x. Okay, so you do the algebra, and then you're going to end up with this function at the very bottom. And I'm going to put this in blue because this is what we're going to label as y2. So again, in the very beginning, we start with the general solution, which is a c1y1 plus c2y2. And we do have a y2 here in red in the general solution. And what we're saying is this. We look at the y2 function that we are using here on the top in red. It has a complex number i. And we don't like that, at least in this part of the semester. And so what we want to do is we, we chose a specific values for C1 and C2. That way we create this new function, which is in the blue box. And that new function is going to be our y2. Okay. And then this, in this case, it's uh, e to the alpha x sine of beta x. All right. So in summary, this is what we have. Remember that we we had our auxiliary equation. So let me just write it out. We had the auxiliary equation, which had the quadratic equation with the variable m. And then from there, we got the m to be some complex numbers, alpha plus minus i beta. So this was the complex rule. This is the third case for the differential equation given to us, which is in red here. All right, so what we, did, what we initially get are y1 is equal to e to the alpha plus i beta x, and y2 is equal to e to the alpha minus i beta x. So those are initially your solutions to the differential equation, and they're perfectly fine depending on your application, um, biology, chemistry, physics, math, pure math, quantum mechanics, or anything like that. Uh, you might you might want to use complex numbers, but for this class at this point we don't want to use the i number, and so we had to do a little bit of algebra by choosing specific values for c1 and c2, and we ended up with these two functions: y1 equals to e to the alpha x cosine beta x, and y2 is equal to e to the alpha x sine beta x. So these are the functions that we'll use. And remember that the specific problem that we were working on, actually, let me go to the slide now. Uh, so we had this, and then we had to remember that after we get the auxiliary equation, uh, which was uh, m squared plus 4m plus 7 is equal to 0, we had the auxiliary equation. And then we had m is equal to, if I remember correctly, uh, 2 plus or minus the square root of 3 with the i. Okay, so those, those were the numbers. m is equal to 2 plus or minus i square root of 3. All right, so technically, we do have two solutions here for this problem, which are y1 e to the 2 plus square root of 3 i x. And then we have the second solution, which is 2 minus i square root of 3 x. And they're perfectly fine solutions. They are solutions to the differential question. The only catch is that they have the i in them. Since we don't want the i for this class, we use the other formats. Okay? So we use y1 is equal to e to the alpha x, which is 2x multiplied by cosine of square root of 3x. And y2 is going to be e to the 2x sine of square root of 3 x. So those are our two solutions that we want to work with. So again, the red, the red functions, they are perfectly uh, true solutions to the differential question. Uh, but the only thing that we don't like about them at this point is that they have the imaginary number i. So instead of using that format of the y1, y2, we're going to use the y1, y2 in blue. They, they kind of represent the same, they, they do represent the same solution set. Um, but the blue functions are real numbers, fun real value functions. They don't have the i in them. All right, so that's a quick explanation of why we use uh, the Euler identity uh, to change the red complex functions to the blue real functions. All right, so that's all I have for today. I hope this was useful. I'll see you next time.